So Nick, I am so excited to see you here on the computer screen. Yeah, here I am in my office in the other end of Berkeley, up in the fog. How are you keeping yourself busy? I'm digitizing photographs, all our old photographs, which is a great thing to do. I'm also doing some writing, which is nice. Um, sort of choosing playlists, that kind of thing. I'm doing a bit of lecturing, actually, uh, at Juilliard and at Yale, um, doing talking to students virtually. So you've probably had a lot of, thing can of stuff canceled. You, you're one of the busiest conductors, and now everything's off the calendar for a while, and you're doing photographs. And is that, does that give you a time to sort of go through your past and kind of consider things and reflect things on things? And it's a feeling of tidiness. It's kind of weeding your the, your garden of life, as it were. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, I mean that's what we have time to do is is to kind of reflect right now. So the name of this um, lecture, or sorry, interview series is Fermata Fridays because okay. we live in a fermata of life right now. And if you want to say any words about thinking of it in that way, um, musically or in your life, or I mean, I think you are speaking to that right now. I think it's very strange uh, as a conductor not to make music. As a player, uh, such as yourself as a musician, uh, you can always practice, you can play. Uh, but conductors, the only sort of practice, you don't practice. I mean, you don't stand in front of a mirror uh, waving your arms around into a CD. That's, what, that's like singing in the shower. It's, uh, you just don't do it. I think the only time I heard anybody um, do that was actually quite shocking, was a friend of mine was in Salzburg the day that Carrion died. And they were, a bunch of people were looking into a storefront window where there were pictures of, or videos of Carrion conducting Beethoven symphonies. And it wasn't until a little while into it that you realized there was actually no orchestra. Ooh. He was actually videoed conducting to his own recordings. Wow. Interesting. Uh, as if he wasn't egocentric enough, that really was uh, like some kind of lovebird with a mirror. Well, probably a lot of us are curious about like, how do you prepare as a conductor if, you, if not in front of the mirror or to a recording? Like, what are you doing when you're preparing your scores? Well, uh, it varies enormously. I mean, uh, I just turned 70, so I've done an awful lot of scores before. Mm -hmm. Also, I played in orchestras for a very long time. So if, uh, if it's a piece, I might have played very often, even if I hadn't conducted it before. Um, which is why I think it's always great if a conductor has played in an orchestra. First of all, you know what the idiot conductor looks like from the other side. Uh, <laughs> and uh, also, it means that you have the experience. In my case, I was a flute player and sometimes a keyboard player. I find it still very hard to take a completely a piece that I never heard of uh, or had never heard, never conducted, never played, and actually have to learn it. Uh, not just the choreography, but just you have to um, have the ideas, you have to, uh, and they, they don't all come at once. And sometimes you can't just sit there and say, I'm going to study for two hours and I'm going to get lots of ideas out of it. Sometimes it just doesn't work that way any more than it does when you're composing it. Sometimes you can have kind of block. When you're sitting, when you were sitting there in, in those orchestras playing the flute, were you sitting there kind of imagining and really studying the conductor before you already thinking like, I want to do that. What is he doing? Can I do that? And how would I do it differently? Were you already preparing? Mostly not. Uh, if it was uh, a very difficult piece, I was mainly thinking about trying to get through it without the conductor noticing me. <laughs> As a flutist, I would imagine that would be difficult, but... <laughs> it is, but yeah, you can't, there's nowhere to hide. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, I grew up in an era, perhaps, which was more, where there were more dictatorial conductors around than there are now. Mm -hmm. uh, East Germany was still a country. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, you will do it this way, and no question, you were certainly not asked a question. Or could you please give me a cue? This is more modern orchestra stuff, perhaps. But then, you know, period instrument orchestras are a lot more give and take than a, mo a lot of modern orchestras are, just to begin with. Um, um, 
and it's much, I've found a period instrument orchestra is much more like a jazz group. I'm, if you like prima sinter pares, I'm, I'm responsible, but I'm also taking feedback, giving, you know, is there anything I can do to help here? Is this a good tempo rather than my way or the highway, you know? And I have to say that playing under you for about 20 years, I saw you more and more uh, becoming that wonderful leader that just kind of enabled everybody to play at their best and to be able to express themselves. And you sort of facilitated that, which I always consider the best quality in a conductor. And it, I felt like you, you sort of evolved more and more in that direction as you, as you went. Is that, does that seem true to you or? Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, I think it is. Also, we, as you say, playing together for a long time, Mm -hmm. It becomes more like chamber music for orchestra. Mm -hmm. It isn't as if you're standing in front of a bunch of complete strangers. There's other things too. If you're playing with a pewin instrument orchestra, it really is a bunch of headstrong personalities and your job is to try and put it together. Very often with the modern orchestra, they're very together, but they've, sub they've subdued their personalities mm -hmm. in, 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 favor of this very beautiful, rather bland togetherness. And so my job is to encourage the personalities of the oboist or the clarinet player or something to, to, to do their own thing. Right. Which is certainly not a problem in a period instrument orchestra. It's actually getting people to be together because they're all doing their own thing. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's interesting. In a, much, in a much greater way, you know. Now I'm going to do a little something here, which I think is an important uh, thing to remember that I think orchestra music is completely different from chamber music. Orchestra music is where a group of musicians are there for the sole purpose of moving, entertaining the audience who are listening. Chamber music, in my view, is a completely different thing. That's written, and I'm talking chamber music before Beethoven, basically, but not Beethoven included to a large extent, it's for the delight of the people who are playing it. Mm -hmm. And the audience are eavesdroppers on what is otherwise and is a perfectly ful fulfilling and satisfying thing. In other words, that for chamber music, the circle is closed and an audience is outside it. Whereas for orchestra music, the circle is open inviting the audience to, to close the circle. Interesting. So, so composers, so let's take Beethoven since it's the 250th year anniversary. I was going to ask you about him anyway. So, so his symphonies are for these huge audiences and his chamber music is for the lucky few that get to kind of converse with each other while they're playing. And how would you describe how the composer's personalities were different for the one or the other? I don't know if it's the personalities, but it's not only uh, that, but also piano sonatas. Mm -hmm. uh, we go to piano recitals, but a lot of piano sonatas were written for um, Beethoven ones, obviously sometimes for himself, but often for uh, Mozart ones, for, for the students to play for themselves. Mm -hmm. Maybe for their immediate family, but it's, it's not always a performance in that way. It's actually to please the person playing it. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes we've lost that. Mm -hmm. There shouldn't be that much difference between a pianist practicing and a pianist playing the sonata for their own enjoyment. One is getting it to the other place, but it's not like, oh, well, I must do this, I must do this, and now I'm going to perform it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I like to think, particularly with period instrument orchestras, that we can take that chamber music thing about the fact that we are having a great deal of fun and a great deal of time, a great deal of enjoyment playing this piece. And the audience, we are playing it for the audience, but we're also playing it for ourselves. And you can tell there's a difference. You, you sometimes have an orchestra uh, that looks about as engaged as a bunch of mummies in an Egyptian museum. You know, they're all playing as opposed to a jazz band, which is having a great time themselves. Right, and right in the moment and responding to what's happening. Yeah, and somebody in the second violins is just 
is as delighted to hear the oboe solo as the audience is. Right. That's a huge difference. Uh, also, I think, for the appreciation of the audience. Uh, it's interesting with the way orchestras developed um, is, and it's also to do with chamber music, is, is actually to do with status. Musicians who played in, a, in an orchestra were paid, often miserably. Uh, they uh, would, uh, they normally played standing up, unless they were cellists, of course. Uh, the Leipzig Gewandhaus played standing up until the 1880s because it was considered rude for poor people to sit in the presence of their betters. Wow. So the audience, the aristocrats were allowed to be sitting, but the, the orchestra had to be standing in front of them. In the same way as we often, as musicians, we don't always know, but we used to have to wear what amounted to the aristocrats cast off clothing, tailcoats that haven't been worn. You know, it's what servants used to wear. In, uh, whereas in chamber music, you always should look in a Haydn quartet, for example, who paid for it. And very often you'll find it's the first violinist, host or whomever. That's right. why they get the best part. Because they're sitting in the group with them. They're sitting in the group and they are the person. You don't think that Telemann, you know, Telemann didn't write, I don't know, 500 recorder sonatas out of a love of music. <laughs> he wrote it because those were the people who played them and they are I'd like a recorder sonata fine that's a hundred bucks please um, it's for that person to have a good time the history of the orchestra and the history of chamber music are very different mm -hmm. uh, chamber music written for aristocrats who could afford it and let's face it it was considered certainly in the 18th century uh, absolutely de rigueur to be able to play mm -hmm. um, some of them some of them of course took it a bit too seriously mm -hmm. so they were more interested in music than they were being an aristocrat right uh, but it's interesting when uh who is it it was sir william hamilton uh who was the british ambassador in naples at the end of the 18th century uh was a pretty good fiddle player and he said, oh, well, I, I can't really play anymore because Count Razumovsky's come along and he's better than me. <laughs> There's a little bit of aristocrat's envy there. Um, but they, they, did, they did play. Uh, the Duke of Wellington's father was described as being the only man in London who could walk down Piccadilly holding a violin case without shame. Because <laughs> it made him look like a musician. Right. That would be very déclassé, I guess. It would be very déclassé. Uh, playing the cello, of course, is a royal instrument. Uh, because it's because it was more like a gamba, or, or... well, the gamba is always an aristocratic mm -hmm. instrument. But uh, the son of George the uh, Second, Prince Freddie, played the cello. The Prince Regent played the cello. The present Prince of Wales plays the cello. Um, and the Prince Regent in the seventeen nineties played piano trios with Haydn. Wow. And, he said he, and Haydn said he was pretty good. And that's in a private diary. He didn't have to say. It. <laughs> <laughs> because you don't say to a prince you're a terrible musician. Uh, but the gamba, of course, is the ultimate instrument. It was also the only vaguely unisex instrument because ladies could play the gamba. So would they do that side saddle or? Uh, they had a tuffet to put the gamba on. The most famous uh, lady gamba player was Madame Oriette, who was the daughter of the King of France. And there's even pictures of her playing the gamba. Mm. But if kings played the gamba, Charles I played the gamba in England, played consorts, which are called the royal consorts. And he must have been pretty good because they're very hard. And again, <laughs> you don't write anything a king can't play. <laughs> You'd be out of a job. You would be out on your ear, let alone out of a job. <laughs> yeah, you'd be in the courtyard, in with what comes out of the back of horses. Uh, Frederick the Great, you know, you know, played, composed, played flute concertos every day, a different one. Um, 
you know, these, some of these people were really good. So none of those aristocrats that were sitting and playing and doing all this chamber music and everything, they would, is it true that they would not be caught dead then sitting in the middle of an orchestra with all those déclassé people that just couldn't happen and following a conductor or somebody else? Well, you'd be surprised. Okay. Uh, the, one of the people who gets a pretty bad press is Archbishop Colorado, who was Mozart's patron in uh, Salzburg, the one who sent a servant to kick Mozart down the stairs or whatever it is, uh, the one who booted him out of Salzburg and everything. He would sometimes join the violin section in the symphonies with Mozart. Okay. Uh, the Tonkünstler group in, uh, that played in the Burgtheater in Vienna they would have an enormous orchestra made up of amateurs, some well-born, as well as uh, regular musicians. So they could field an orchestra of about a hundred sometimes, uh, made up of everybody who wanted to play. Wow. Uh, one of the things that surprised Mendelssohn when he uh, went to London was that very often in a if there was a, a house concert, you know all about house concerts because you give them in your own house, uh, that there would be the instrumentalists and then across the room would be a little red rope to prevent the musicians mingling with the aristocrats. Talk about social distancing. It was a social distancing, but it never applied to Mendelssohn because they regarded him as a gentleman because he never charged to play. Is that because he came from a very well-to-do family? Is that part mm -hmm. of that? Yeah. Yes, he was regarded as being on the, as somebody who could transcend that little red rope and uh, play, be in the audience, mingle with the audience, as opposed to the other ones who uh, had to stay on the musician's side of it. How would Beethoven have fit in with these kinds? I mean, I can't imagine he would respect any sort of red ropes or anything like that. Oh, I don't think he did. I think he was regarded as a sort of bit of a trendsetter, wild man who was the talk of the town because he could play the piano better than everybody else. But uh, he didn't, you know, the ladies would say yes, but he could use a comb and maybe a <laughs> Uh, uh, but most of these famous composers earned more money probably from teaching than they probably did from composing because there's no such you never got any money for things that were published no such thing as perform uh, publishers rights copyright and you didn't get any money unless you performed so Mozart could write the marriage of Figaro it would be performed when he conducted it in Vienna and Prague, but then when it was done in Berlin, he didn't get anything. It's amazing. It, everything was in the public domain. So you only got paid if you were actually, uh, if you actually performed it. And of course, sometimes you didn't really get paid. If you were performing for a king, you might get a gold snuff box. <laughs> I mean, that doesn't feed the family. Right. So going back to the idea of it really behooves you to be close to these aristocrats and people who had a lot of money when you're a musician. Yes. Uh, and uh, that's why even someone like Mozart was looking all the time for some kind of official job from the emperor. I think he got one as the official composer for dance music. Well, <laughs> the best he could do. Best he could do, uh, which makes Beethoven, of course, even weirder and more groundbreaking in the sense that he he didn't have a royal or imperial position. And all that was starting to break down anyway, because it's important to remember that when Beethoven was in Vienna, for at least most of his time, from 1795 up till 1815, Europe was at war. Um, it's very, it's a rather touching story, actually, that when Haydn was dying in 1809, uh, Napoleon's army was actually invading Vienna. And Haydn was the biggest rock star of composers everywhere, especially in France, everyone loved his music. And so uh, some general uh, put straw down on the roads near Haydn's house 
so that the troops and the cannons and the wagon wheels wouldn't make so much noise and disturb. Wow. Talk about respect. <laughs> yes, he, had, he was an enormously respected musician and uh, worldwide. And wow. uh, that was, you know, for somebody who was the son of a wheelwright in a tiny village that's now much too close to Vienna Airport, he'd really come a long way. And he got like one of the cushiest jobs of any composer, didn't he, at Esterhazy, would you say? Oh, yeah. Well, he had to work really, really, really hard. Yeah. Uh, point one. Um, I mean, sometimes it really does say written in my sleep on someone's called one of the horn concertos, I think. Uh, so he had to produce a lot of music. Clearly, he was very good, good at it. But what clearly happened was that his patron uh, loved the music and, and, and got it and appreciated it. Uh, he wasn't just somebody who had to write music because uh, it was considered a good thing to have a court orchestra or something like that. Um, so he was much appreciated, but even so, he had to use the servants' entrance. Yeah. But even though he was the second highest paid member of the court. And it's a composer's dream to be really gotten like that. And you just hear all this amazing, imaginative, inventive, like all those piano sonatas that we don't hear enough of. I mean, those are just incredible. And, that, and you look at the dedications and it will, it's for, well, some of them are written were dedicated to the prince himself, but a lot of them to the daughters because Haydn taught them. Yeah. And Beethoven did that as well. He was, he was, uh, he had many aristocratic um, pupils, mm -hmm. some of whom must have played really well. Mm -hmm. um, but he had a little problem, I think, that he, uh, he often fancied them a bit. Oh. He was lonely and he was trying to make connections. <laughs> yes, I think he, he was always on the lookout for a date. Aww. And of course, the deafer he got, the worse it was, because he couldn't really communicate. Or, and then, of course, he found teaching harder and harder. But he did certainly have, I want to say, aristocratic friends. Uh, uh, I think that's true to a point. Uh, some of these princes, Lobkowitz and uh, the emperor's brother, to whom the Mr. Solemnis is dedicated, and also who, the one who has the piano, for whom the piano part of the triple concerto is written. Um, I wouldn't say they were buddies you'd go out for a beer with, <laughs> but um, they obviously uh, wanted to support Beethoven. And uh, who must have been quite difficult. Um, and of course, then not being able to have a proper conversation. Uh, with somebody like that. I mean, he, Beethoven does complain enormously of, of loneliness. Yeah. Uh, and so Beethoven fits into it, I think, like a naughty rock star. <laughs> Everyone knew he was brilliant, but they also knew that he wasn't, uh, he wasn't prepared to uh, come in through the servant's entrance. Mm -hmm. He's one of the first people, I think, who got annoyed if people talked while he played. Mm-hmm. Didn't he like really hate it when people would cry and stuff? Like he would think of these cretins, like what are they doing while I'm playing? And... Yeah, he wanted complete attention. Yeah. <laughs> On the other hand, he did want them to be transported. There's a, a line which uh, is supposedly a quote of his, which I really like. I'm just going to read it actually. He, he says that music is a higher revelation than all wisdom and philosophy. The wine which inspires one uh, to a new generative process, and I am the Bacchus who presses out this glorious wine for mankind and makes them spiritually drunken. I love that. Now, that's supposedly from Brentano, who's possibly his wife is the immortal beloved, I don't know. And then he goes on, very sad, I have not a single friend, I must live alone, but well I know that God is nearer to me than to other artists. I associate with him without fear. I have always recognized and understood him and have no fear for my music. It can meet no evil fate. Well, he had that sense of ecstasy, I think we could say. And uh, one of the things I think that uh, 
I think it's worth mentioning because you've probably been on them when Philharmonia has done Beethoven symphonies and then we've recorded them. I Luckily, I think every one of them we've recorded live. The play of Beethoven symphony in the studio um, doesn't cut it for me. You need that idea of the Bacchus of driving the audience into a frenzy, of <laughs> taking the risks. Because if it's just safe and perfect, it seems to me it's, the, it's not there. In the same way as if you had absolutely perfect Janacek. <laughs> yeah, doesn't make sense. <laughs> doesn't make sense. It's got to be on the edge of collapse to make the audience just about in a frenzy. And that's why the end of Beethoven symphonies, I think the audience should be, if not actually clapping 20 departs before the end, they should be like this. Exactly. <laughs> Whereas yeah. if you actually just play, bam, bam, it's just like hitting your head like those monks in Monty Python. Uh, and it doesn't achieve very much, except possibly making you laugh. But um, it's got to be on, it's got to be very risky. Uh, you know, Beethoven's piano shouldn't feel, Beethoven's piano should, definitely feel in need of a bit of therapy and TLC after the hammer clavier. You shouldn't be playing it like this, you know what I mean? The strings could break, should break. Right. It should be out of tune by the end, maybe. Right. Uh, it's got to be on the edge. And safe Beethoven, for me, is like a, you know, a bar that only serves orange juice. <laughs> Well, I'm glad you brought that up in this anniversary year of Beethoven, where we're all thinking about him so much. And also some of my best memories in, in Philharmonia is doing Beethoven symphonies with you, and partially also because you brought so much humor to them, which is so often lacking in, I think he got sort of like stuck in some kind of serious pompous mode in people's minds. And I felt like, um, some of your interpretations just completely let all that stuff go. Oh, thank you. I, mean, I think it's a great thing for me about the Viennese classics, uh, Haydn, obviously Mozart too, and Beethoven, is that they did have a great sense of wit. Mm -hmm. They lead you to expect something and then don't deliver. They deliver something completely different. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think you've really got to, uh, you can't just sort of uh, lie back and let it wash over. You've got to be an engaged audience member to say, I think I know what's coming, but he's telling you this. In the same way as if you're listening to a joke, you have to go with it and suddenly it'll take a, a wrong turning and that's what's funny. Mm -hmm. and that's why I think sometimes you also get things like the, uh, the Turkish bit in, the end, in Beethoven 9, where the, bas the double bassoon plays its absolutely lowest note, which sounds as if an, uh, a rather gassy elephant is about to come in. Uh, and you have no idea what's going on. It's, it's, uh, it's not pretty. Yeah, and totally unexpected and crazy. And in the wrong key and everything else. It's, uh, you know, it would make people drop their M&Ms to listen to it back then. Mm -hmm. it's, amazing. Uh, it's a chuckle. Mm -hmm. It's a surprise. It's a, oh, Beethoven. <laughs> <laughs> You'll shock my aunt. <laughs> but that's the point. Yeah. Uh, it's wonderful. Uh, so I think uh, it, is, it, it is then on the other end, you can get the heart meltingly beautiful, sustained, slow music. Um, Obviously, say the symphonies, the slow movement of the fourth symphony, which is the, the, the first enormous slow movement, the, one of the slowest of his slow movements. First two symphonies don't have very slow, slow movements, but uh, fourth does. Um, and uh, some of the, uh, those big, like the patatique or big, slow, slow movements uh, that just stretch out ever um, you can get right in them and, and then this goes off to something completely different uh, it, 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 it is of course amazing brilliant music and uh, one of the things I think that's great in our lifetimes 
is that we've been able to playing period instruments to whereas uh, a generation before us would have spent all their time uh, playing Bach, Kalaman, Vivaldi, which is great. Really in the 1980s, things started to push and into the 90s too, into the classical realm, where I think period instruments have just as much to offer, uh, obviously pianos. Right. Which are totally different. Uh, but also just the way a piano trio on period instruments balances compared to how it does on modern instruments, which is they often the pianist has to put the lid down, the, the cellist and the violins have to play as loudly as they possibly can just to be heard. That's clearly rubbish, musically rubbish. It's, uh, it's miscasting of the worst type, um, whereas it works brilliantly on period instruments. It solves so many problems. It's yeah. Amazing. Uh, anyway, it's a it's a fascinating uh, subject, but music does get louder and bigger and grander. Balls get bigger and grander, and of course, more of us go to those concerts, which means that the halls have to get bigger, which means the instruments have to get louder. Exactly, and going back to what you were saying before about chamber music being sort of written for the players and this very intimate thing, and then yeah. suddenly, you know you're trying to like punch it out to the back row of some giant hall. It just makes the music sound crazy. Yeah, and it's important to remember that with for most people, unless they lived in a capital city, they would not be able to hear a Beethoven symphony or a Mozart symphony unless it was in a range for piano duet. Right. Or for piano trio. Piano trio, yeah. Uh, that you that you first learn these pieces by either hearing them in your living room or else playing them yourself. And some of those arrangements are absolutely wonderful. Hummel's arrangements of Mozart piano concertos are terrific. Uh, and also Mozart symphonies or string quartet, flute, and a bit of piano, something like that. This is how you would learn music in the same way as a lot of people in art historians, or art sculptors and so on, would, own, would never see actual Roman sculptures. They would only ever see plaster casts of them, not the real thing. Right. But it's how you'd get to know what, what, what they were. And so, uh, I, I'm rather hoping, actually, to be able to get out my volume of Beethoven symphonies for piano duet and actually play them. Ooh. I may sneak out and play piano duets with a neighbor. Because wow. she has a nice piano and it doesn't need to be tuned. My, my old forte piano uh, is wretchedly out of tune and piano tuners are not considered essential businesses. So I think it's, it would be hard to run a police cordon to come up here to get the piano tuned. It's true, yeah. Well, that's a great idea. What a wonderful thing for us all to be doing right now is spending time at home, learning all these incredible pieces ourselves. And Such fun to, it, it's like cooking, <laughs> making bread. You get it in your fingers and actually do it as opposed to just read about making a loaf. You can actually, make it. It may not turn out very well, it may not be very good, but it's at least it, it, you've got the benefit of it. Exactly. It's that's wonderful. Fun. That's fun. Well, thank you so much for this fascinating conversation that covered so many things. And uh, I have to say one of the silver linings of this moment is getting to have things like this happen that, that never could have happened otherwise. Oh, it's great fun. I think uh, use it well, as they say. Such fun. Bless you, my dear. All the best. Thank you. You too.